scripture, the chapter, uh, the chapter we were going through, or I was assigned, was uh, about people who claim that they have hotline to God, and of course, that's always a big question mark. Um, the the things that the, the book was asking, if people claim that they have this direct hotline, is it is it divine? Is it psychological, or is it diabolical? Now, I looked at all, I, I was reading through the chapter, and uh, I wanted to share things that I've also learned uh, on how to answer the claims when people says God speaks directly to me, especially when they talk about, or when they say, oh, this is true because it says so in the scriptures. Um, the, you know, when they have uh, comments or when they have this, um, this adamant belief that they have a hotline to God. Now, what I learned from the past year when I was studying a little bit more of the historical context of the Bible, what was surprising to me was in the ancient Near East or the Old Testament where it's Mesopotamia, uh, Arcadian and all this, the, when Israel got out of Egypt, uh, when Israel during the Exodus, um, Israel was known, I think a better word would be they were, they were feared, uh, much like you would see the story in Rehab. Uh, where he housed the, the, the spies for, for Israel. And she was afraid of, and she heard all the news about Israel. So many non-Jews actually at that time who were not under the covenant of Israel, meaning they were not servants, they were not uh, um, the, the handmaids or, or whatnot. Many of those who were not under the covenant of Israel abandoned their gods and worshiped Yahweh, but they did not adhere to the Torah, meaning they were not within Israel. They, they just abandoned their gods and said, Israel's God is more powerful. Uh, we will start worshiping Yahweh, but they still adhere to their own tradition and not according to the Torah. In the second temple period, you fast forward there, which is the, the era of the gospels. Many Gentiles convert to Judaism. Uh, you would see this in when Jesus was upset at the temple, when he rebuked the the ruling council in the Sanhedrin, the scripture he used was he was angry because people were making it hard even for other people to worship God, meaning the Gentiles. Um, but the sad truth is a lot of people convert due to economics. Uh, they want to trade with the Jews, that they felt like it would be easier to trade with the Jews if they themselves convert. Again, they converted but still kept their traditions. Now, post-cross, like in the Acts that you can see, uh, you would see there, of course, many Gentiles genuinely convert to Christ. However, the fast growth and cultural compromise, along with the lack of understanding of Old Testament, leads to presumptions that were unbiblical. Uh, you, you would see the, the argument that Paul makes about, uh, about sac food sacrifice to idols. You would see the, the context of when Barnabas went to Antioch, he did not know what to make of the Antioch church. So he had to look for Paul for help. So there was a lot of things uh, that the Gentiles were doing that uh, Paul felt or, or Barnabas felt like was not what they're used to in the Jewish tradition. Uh, this also led later on to what we call the Judaizers with the understanding of when they saw the Gentiles being converted, they felt like that's not right. You know, if they're doing things which we're not doing. They're not going to synagogue. They're not doing the diet. So the, the Judaizers basically made uh, this, this, uh, this thing where if you're going to follow Jesus, then you need to be a Jew like Jesus. So that kind of get got the ball rolling, meaning there's a lot of things that were practiced that were unbiblical. Paul argued about it in the New Testament. So the reason why I'm saying this um, the things that people do that are unbiblical were not just because of Christian, um, uh, the, the, the Judeo-Christian, um, what you call this, lure of people, oh, uh, Yahweh is a better God, Jesus is a better way. Marami ako nakita mga convert ng mga Muslim. And their reason is because uh, Christianity is easier. You know, and I would always correct them. It's not easy. It's simple. It's two different things. Okay. If it's easy, then, you know, it should, it could not, it's, uh, Christianity is not worth it. It's just simple to understand because that's what he's wanted. If you pass over to the modern era, 
today this is what we see okay conviction has become convenience that's what was stated in the book about meron si Doug Jacobin na mention na drive through christianity they drive through they get the communion bread they hear the, the message of the day and then they drive away uh christianity is not complete surrender anymore but an option it's a lifestyle knowing jesus is synonymous to agreeing with your pastor or evangelist not full and not about fully exploring the bible uh you would see this in many different churches now uh, or or pseudo pseudo churches uh marami kang makikita sa hill songs elevation and they, they would preach all these different things that's not entirely biblical uh standing up for the principles that Jesus taught stood for fought for and died for is buried and twisted and called progressive it's called new age and it's called relevant they use the same lingo but it does not mean the same thing those that know Jesus assume uh, those that do not know Jesus they assume they know things about the bible those that do know Jesus the right way is labeled bigot and uh, and outdated Uh, were actually criticized for for stating what we believe about certain aspects of our culture, whether it's LGBTQ, whether it's uh, uh, certain persecutions in the Middle East, whether you're standing for Israel or not, you are labeled uh, a bigot and you're asked to shut up because your opinion is 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 uh, not in accordance with what modern society is asking to do. And then that's what we're going to be talking about today. There are those who claim. and these are mainly the charismatic movements who claim that god speaks directly to me and so whatever they say um is what is actually should be followed uh, i found this very interesting uh, to see all this that a lot of these things in history actually repeat itself for people who wants to have that idol of uh, being right with god but not truly knowing what god wants There's always litmus test questions when it comes to certain things like this. When people claim this, uh, especially when they use scripture to defend their position, um, litmus test, as you know, in chemistry, it's when you determine whether something is acid or base. There's the it's like there's no going way around it. I've always asked these questions to people, especially those you know, who are prophesy, you who are say, "Oh, this is this is what God wants. This is I prayed about. This, this is what." God answered you know uh, and they in the use scripture because this is what happened in the old testament you know are there specific events that happen in scripture normative meaning does it happen often in scripture does it happen as often as prayers do or or people repenting or is it something that was did it serve a purpose was there something that we, and, and if there was a purpose what was that purpose if the purpose is to proclaim uh god's message that if they don't repent they're going to die uh there there is that uh, but there is a certain purpose when god speaks to people it wasn't something that happens like on a daily daily basis now fundamentally uh and this is what doug was asking when you meet people like this when, and and we test ourselves we ask ourselves how do we know the truth how do we know the truth and in fully understanding the statement that the spirit's work is the same then as it is today it is to it is dedicated to changing lives and advancing the kingdom of god yeah it's not about uh, it's not about creating miracles that that makes people get attracted more it, it's about truly helping people understand who god is now what to keep in mind when you Uh, encounter people and i know in the philippines maraming ganito na nagclaim especially among charismatic um that uh, this is this is how they know the spirit is with them this is how they maraming mga doctrines ang lumalabas but what to keep in mind uh, in Ephesians 2 verse 18 to 21 for through him we both have access in one spirit to the father so that you are no longer strangers and aliens but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of god built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the lord uh, later on in in chapter 3 when you read this you can perceive my insight into the mystery of Christ which has not been made known to the sons of men in other generations 
as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. What these two verses are actually saying is that the foundation of the church, of the kingdom, uh, it's already been there. It's already been built. There is no more need to build a new foundation. So when, when, when you're building something, it's always based on what Christ did and what the apostles did. So the claims are, oh, that God speaks directly to me, there, there's a lot of confusion there because we don't know, okay, si God ba talaga yung nagkasalita? Is, is that really... Marami na ako confused because they're not really in tune with what the scripture is saying. You know, the, the, the chapter talks about the 10 areas of confusion. I don't know if I can talk about it in, in detail. I will just go through it. Um, you know, the gifts of prophecy. I think it's popular that, oh, I prophesy this. I've actually encountered people doing this. Uh, and a lot of the Tamarin C. Doug, the scriptures they often use in the New Testament is that, you know, there were prophets in the New Testament, like Agabus. Um, in Acts 21, Philip's daughters uh, of the seven, Philip, not the apostle, but the one of the, the seven with Stephen, um, you know, and, and the, pop, the Agabus was prophesying about Paul's persecution. You know, the purpose was to help the church. When, when Agabus talked about the drought, it was to help the church in need. Uh, it was to warn Paul, but Paul, regardless of the prophecy, still went and preach the word of God to the Gentiles. You know, it, it wasn't a matter of this prophecy comes true, you need to obey what I'm saying. It's more of, uh, it was presented, it, now we can see what the attitude of people were uh, when it comes to, to the mission and the church. Paul will preach regardless of what he heard. Uh, that was his mission. Now, um, the, the, the idea of the gifts of prophecy is something that God says. It would not matter. It would still matter how you respond to what you hear and to what you know. Kung may bagyo, how do you respond? Kung may magkasabi, may bagyo, how do you respond? It's all about helping your brothers and sisters. You know, when we talk about discerning the spirits, this is when people say, oh, I can tell you if you're a good person or not because God is telling me. I can tell you if, you, if you're dishonest because God tells me you're dishonest. Uh, and they use scriptures in 2 Thessalonians 2 verse 2 when it says, we ask you brothers not to quickly be shaken in mind and alarmed either by spirit or spoken word or the letter seeming to uh, seem to be from us to the effect that the day of the Lord has come. So the, the issue with Thessalonians were uh, people were no longer doing anything. They were just waiting for the second coming. Um, but here Paul was saying, he wasn't saying do not be alarmed by a spirit. He wasn't saying by by some by some disembodied entity. He was the the word in Greek was pneuma, spirit, which also meant prophecy. You know what? So what he's saying is, somebody goes with a gift of prophecy and telling you, you should discern whether that prophecy is something you should follow or not. You know, it is not about telling whether a person has a good spirit or not, but it's about understanding in context. What Second Thessalonians was actually saying is that in context, you should test out whatever message you hear, if it truly is a message from God or not. And you can only do that through scripture. Um, <clears throat> fleecing. This is something very popular even with, with, with believers. Um, this was, uh, a lot of them would use this, Gideon 6, 36 to 40, but even that, the young story of Gideon was, God, if, you know, God already called him, and then he asked God, God, if the fleece is dry, I'll go, and the ground is wet, you know, or, or the other way around, and in, in everything that he asked for God, God responded, and it's almost a point that he had no choice. People use this and say, oh, this is, Oh, if God, if the light is green, I'm going to go for it. You know, I'm, I'm going to go with this decision. If the light is red, then no. A lot of us would ask for signs. Now, is it wrong to ask for signs? You know, I, I'm a bit uh, on, the, on the fence on that one. Okay. But when you were, we're asking signs to test God instead of uh, for our decisions, in the same way where Satan was tempting Jesus, when he was fasting, uh, Jesus responded by quoting scripture. Uh, in, he was saying, do not put the Lord your God to test. 
in essence, that's what fleecing is. That is what asking or demanding God for a sign. You're putting God to the test. You're making, you're asking God to play your game. And in essence, what's scary is that God is no way obligated to play your game, but some other spirits might play your game and some other spirits might actually answer you. Um, <clears throat> the peace of Christ, though, if you pray and you're uneasy about what you're praying for, keep praying, keep praying, keep praying until you're, you have the peace of Christ in your heart. And then you're, you're, you're okay with whatever decision that is. That is purely psychological. The scripture they use, of course, is the peace of Christ is to rule in our hearts. Uh, when you pray the rule, the peace of Christ has to be there. Um, this is out of context because Paul was talking about the peace of Christ among in relationships, not what you pray for. Um, I learned this part in, in NLP where if you have an easiness in your heart, like you're trying to decide something, but you're very uneasy. Whether you're trying to decide to forgive somebody or we're trying to decide on a business decision that's a bit questionable. The uneasiness usually you feel is because there's incongruency between your values and goal. You hold on to your values, but your goal is this, that you need to do something that you feel like it, it, it's not right, okay? So there's that uneasiness. And the reason why you feel at ease is because that kind of goes together now, your values and your goals. Um, so that's a little bit more psychological. Um, when you do it in, in prayer, when you're really asking for God to work in there, is for you to do the righteous thing before God and to be, to be at peace with the righteous thing and, and not whether the righteous decision you need to make. Um, answered prayer, uh, again, a bit tricky. Does God answer prayers? Yes. Has he answered your prayers? De definitely yes. But can it be concluded that we have a direct line to God? I don't know. You know, it's like prayer in itself puts you in the presence of God. And, and that's awesome. That's the that experience we want to feel or we want to be uh, or have conviction about. Prayers help us grow in our faith. But whenever our prayers are answered, it's not, it's not a conclusive verification that, oh, this is, this is how God talks to me. When my prayers are answered, this is what God wants. It's inconclusive because even unbelievers' prayers get answered. Even among believers, let's say one prays for the Celtics to win, one prays for the Lakers to win. Of course, one team is going to win. Does that mean God listens to you more? And God doesn't listen to the person who played for the, for the Celtics. It doesn't work that way. You know, it, 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 whatever we respond to how God answers our prayer determines how much we grow in our faith. You know, when people say they hear voices and, and they use Isaiah 30 verse 21, in your ears shall hear a word behind you saying, this is the way you walk in it. When you turn to the right or to the left, you know, since I've been old, this is what Isaiah said, you know, I would hear a voice. Again, psychological. You know, God speaking directly to people were such rare occurrences. Most of the time, there were neurological experiences, like they would hear God, but other people wouldn't. Other people would hear thunder, but they wouldn't, they wouldn't hear the voice of God. Um, and, and, and this can really be more, and besides, if you put this in a, in a court, and you ask for witnesses, and you ask, how did you know, and God told me, it's not going to work well, okay? It's, so people who claim they heard voices, most likely it's a psychological issue. Dreams, I've encountered this with Muslims. Uh, they, they convert mainly because they have a dream of Jesus telling them to forsake uh, Islam. Um, but the, the, the thing that happens there is after they, they, they're wrestling with their Christianity and their uh, being Muslim, after that dream, they don't have that dream anymore. So it, it yes, I, I'm not, I, I tell them, listen, I'm not discounting the fact that the spirit or God is trying to get your attention regarding the matter. That's something that you prayed about, something that you meditated about. But it can also be concluded that you're so, you're so focused on this issue uh, that you actually dream about it and you know in your heart what the right thing to do is. You know, so it, can, uh, it is 
uh, it is con it can be concluded as a very rare occurrence for people because a lot of times what we dream about is what we saw the day before. So it's not really just, you know, and if we do dream about it, yeah, maybe God is trying to get your attention, but it's not some normative thing that's going to happen every day or whatever you dream about. That's how God communicates with you. No cost exegesis. Now, this is something I, do, I don't think they use scriptures for this one, but what they're saying or what people say is that when you read the Bible, if your heart is right, like if your heart is pure, you, you don't have any sin when you're reading it, and, when, and no malice in your heart whatsoever. Uh, if you read it, if and that's how you interpret it, it will be trustworthy, case in point. Um, and I don't want to harp about uh, the LGBTQ, but I have to, because this is what you hear all the time. Oh, I, I read the Bible and says, God is love. God accepts you for what you are. So that means God accepts me for what I am. That that's that taking scriptures out of context is often done so because of subjectivity. Oh, this is what God wants. I believe it so because my heart says it so. But you're not taking the Bible contextually. You're, you're taking it because this is what it means to you, but you're not understanding the full context. Casting lots. Uh, again, this is done in the New Testament and the Old Testament. Uh, it's done in Buddhism. It's done in Hinduism. It's when you draw. It's when you draw something out of chance and you say that that's the will of God. Uh, you've seen this when they chose Matthias. You've seen this when they Jonah and Paul out of the boat. Uh, they they were drawing lots. Um, it is not a sin when you toss coins or mangko um, pompiang kayo, jack and boy, or drawing straws. It's not a sin to do. Is it is used to settle a simple dispute like where do you want to eat? Where do you want to go today? You know, but whatever you do when you do it, it should never be considered as discerning God's will when you do it, because truly it is just a matter of chance. When people do it and say, "Oh, let's find out God's will." And they throw a dice. That's God's will, you know. It's it's something that is very dangerous for people to make conclusions about uh, from the Lord. You know, if it's God, if it's God's will, it's gonna happen. And 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 they use the example of 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 the Old Testament. Funny enough, when you look at the story of of Saul and David, it's often when when Saul is sleeping, David's men would go. God has given Saul to you. Go ahead and kill him. You know, and and David would respond, "No, I cannot lift a finger on God's anointing." It is true that everything is from the Lord. Uh, the events, the people in your life, answered prayers, they all come from God. But how do you respond to to, to what God allows is on you? You know, if you're if you're responding righteously, if you're responding and saying, "Oh, God." You know, God favors me because he answered my prayer. You know, you, you see there's a little bit of pride in there. But David wanted to always act righteously regardless of what God puts in front of him. And this is how we need to look at when people say it's from the Lord. If you're sure it's from the Lord, then you need to know and then you need to do the right thing. Because God, is, God could be testing you or some other spirit could be giving it to you. But the real question or the real litmus test is, are you going to do what is righteous before God? You know, what is our end? No, that's the 10. Okay. But what is our goal as believers? You know, to help the confused by listening carefully to what they're saying. When, when people come to you, when you're studying the Bible with these people, it's easy to interrupt them and tell them that they're wrong. It's a lot, you know, more challenging to actually listen to to what they're actually saying. Um, when we need to guide them to find the answers, we need to ask them questions. Uh, what, what exactly are you saying? What did you feel? Often enough, you should differentiate their emotions. Often repeat back what they said to them and give emphasis. And when you say, when they say things like, I feel this is what God is telling me. So let me, let me get this straight. You feel this is what God, you don't know. You feel this is what God is telling you. So you, you don't know, right? You know, so it's good to repeat things back to them because that's what they said. You know, always point them back to scripture and not subjective experience. You can always appreciate and say, I appreciate the experience you had. I'm pretty sure that's, that's something I cannot relate to. 
but I want to talk about this script. You know, be patient, which is a challenge in itself. Be logical ourselves, uh, but don't be confrontive, but more of asking them questions so they can understand. Uh, use the scriptures you already teach. You know, uh, the other part is helping the uh, confusing the helpful because these are people with good hearted people with the, I love this phrase with Doug Jackie. They're the good, they're the good hearted people with delusions of divine grandeur. Like they really believe they're servants of God. Uh, in, in second Peter said, he, Paul writes the same way in all his letters, speaking to them in these matters. His letters contain some things that are hard to understand, which ignorant and unstable people distort as they, as they do to other scriptures to their own destruction. Therefore, dear friends, since you know this, be on your guard so that you may not be carried away by the errors of lawless men and fall from your own secure position. You know, the idea that people would say, I think, I think that verse is, I don't think that verse is inspired. I don't think that no longer that, uh, still applies or that's just your interpretation. It's people, uh, Peter actually said people will twist and distort scripture. The, the fundamental question always goes back. So how do you know the truth? Because many people will, will manage to circumvent the Bible by coming up with their own private hotline with God. This is what God is telling me. Whatever the Bible says no longer matters because God talks to me directly. Um, what's the, we should not be alarmed at it. We should actually be saying, oh, this is exactly what Peter was saying. People will distort uh, scripture. And it's, it's, it was, that's what they did in the Old Testament. It, uh, that's what they did in, in the Second Temple period. That's what they did post cross That's what they're still doing today. It's not something that's new. It's always been happening. People will, will like the idea that they're right with God without knowing what the scriptures are actually saying. So that whether the hotline to God, is it divine, psychological, or diabolical? Definitely, for sure, it is not divine. Okay? When people say, oh, this is, this is God telling me, and they make that normative, they make that as a normal part of their life, red flags should fly up in our heads. Okay, something is not right. Okay, um, today, when people say they're speaking for God or the spirit, uh, uh, it's not normal. In fact, it is more often associated with the supernatural or the occult practices. Mga manguhula or, or, or whatever, mga agima, that this is, oh, this is what God wants. If, if it does not go in line with what the spirit wants in advancing the kingdom and changing people's lives, and depending on God and listening to God and really having a relationship with God, most likely, in fact, I'm 100% sure that whatever they're saying uh, is not from God, but from a different spirit. And that's what we should always be testing. The question to ponder, do I know anybody who is deeply confused about God and the spirit? Somebody who would be, uh, or somebody who would be helped by this information. You know, you look at all this lesson, uh, you look at the book, says, hmm, are there people, I know my parents are, but uh, when, at one point I told them the miracles you're doing is not really biblical. And I showed them scripture and they actually stopped. They're still in the charismatic, yeah, Catholic charismatic, but they're more level-headed uh, when I tell them yeah, the, these things that you're saying and doing and hearing, you know, you got to look at the scripture, whether it's, it's in accordance with the Bible. Do I tend instinctively to trust my first interpretation of a passage of scripture or am I willing to work at it until I understand the text? This is what I always tell people. If you have questions about what you read, good. Because you're meant to have questions. Because when you ask questions, then you look for the answer. Um, but you know, when, when we first see it and say, oh, this must be what the scripture is saying, look some more. Most likely you're missing something. You know, is it possible that I have retained some of my old superstitious nature from my pre-Christian days? Um, for me, I've been a Christian for so long. I, I, I mean, I was baptized in 1990. I, I can't recall any more of my pre-Christian days. But there are things that I still uh, would go along with. Um, but I wouldn't say that was part of my nature. But again, these are questions we can we should be answering in our D group tomorrow. 
And that's it. Uh, 